you were one of the main targets for racist chants. I grew up learning to have thick skin. I don't agree with what happened in there, but nor at the same time am I going to let it get under my skin. I just think it should be dealt with straight away. Now, all players have to stand up and say something or post something on social media. That's wrong. It shouldn't get that far. There's enough governing bodies around football stadiums to take care of those situations. I'm not one that ever keeps talking about it because I feel like the more people talk about it, people pay more attention to it. It just needs to die out and they just need to start banding people that do stuff like like that from football for good. Sean Wright Phillips, a former Premier League footballer, playing for the likes of Man City, QPR, and of course Chelsea, where he won the Premier League. I met Sean Wright Phillips because I was playing alongside of him at the Gumball Rally at Inter Miami, in Miami of course. I spoke to him about racism and how we dealt with it on the pitch and off the pitch. Plus now he's a retired footballer, what he's doing with his spare time. This is one of the best podcasts I've ever done and what a fantastic guest he was. Subscribe today. Sean, Sean Wright Phillips, thank you very much, sir, for agreeing to come onto the podcast. As you well know, or Jason definitely knows this because I've been badgering him rather than you, because <laughs> uh, he's like the gatekeeper. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously very, very interested, intrigued speaking to athletes. Uh, being a kind of passive athlete myself, I do a bit on the side boxing, I competed out 16 fights. I love to get inside the athlete's mind because that, that will to win, determination, etc. And I think a lot of young people can learn from that. And I also do think that if you can win in your sport or in the gym or competing, you can transfer that into other aspects of your life, whether that's family, social, business, etc. So anyway, conversation coming up. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Sean. No problem. So... I'm going to list some of your, not accolades, well, yeah, accolades, but but more importantly, the people that you pay for. I mean, Manchester City, Chelsea being my team, QPR, New York Red Bulls, right, with your brother, uh, yeah. and, and Phoenix, is it Phoenix Rising FC, they're called? Yeah. Um, but I reckon the best thing out of your whole career is when you play with me at the Gumball Rally charity <laughs> match. <laughs> no, but seriously, it was it was it, it, was, cool. it was awesome. I had so much fun. It was cool. How rubbish was I? No, it wasn't about it wasn't about rubbish. But it's it's the calls in it really. You got to think about what where it's all going and what it's in aid of. And I think it it was fantastic to see other people that may not have a clue how to play football trying to play it just for the cause of it and I just thought it was great yeah we were doing every week uh, with the Gumball team um, we were practicing our football but doing five aside and I actually did, obviously there's aspects of it like your touch and kicking the ball etc that really is, it does help you and assist but in actual fact getting onto a bigger pitch it was like I was starting again like it literally wasn't the same feel and I, I actually was I mean partly because I've just done a massive long drive and I was partying all the time but bar that it was I kind of was a bit like shocked by it all I don't I don't think I could keep up with the pace of it because it was different to the five aside yeah and that's I think that's what a lot of people don't get a lot of people play five aside seven aside and think they can play football but once you step onto the big pitch it's, it's a complete different ball game altogether because you've got to think about your positioning and how it if you're not in that position, how it can affect your team. As you saw with our team, when we had some subs coming on, we was trying to play offside, but we had a defender standing on the 18 yard box. Mm. So there's loads of variables within an 11 aside game. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I mean, it was great to share the picture with you and other athletes from different walks of life or different sports, etc. And it, that, that whole entire trip, the whole Gumball Rally thing, how they put it together from Toronto all the way down to Miami was exceptional. And to play on a football pitch with someone like yourself and my business partner etc I mean honestly it's like a bucket list kind of kind of thing for me so it was really really good I'm going to sort of start the conversation a little bit different because normally when I interview boxers rugby players football players it is kind of about the mindset it's also kind of about your career and what you've achieved and some of the challenges but I want to ask a bit of a a different question that you've probably been asked over your career and it might be something that you know the media might, might might have made you a little bit sick of, but obviously having such a great father, yeah, second highest goal scorer for Arsenal uh, in history, I think behind Terry Henry. Yeah. Then you got Crystal Palace. I mean, he made a, such a huge name for himself there. But I think he's third top goal scorer for Crystal Palace. Is it like preconceptions from fans, from the public that oh, because you are the son of such a legend, you've got massive high expectations. Does that create sort of unnecessary pressure for you? 
Um, yeah, it was always something was there since I was playing Sunday League football, both for me and my brother. But I just think the way we was brought up, especially by our mum, because our mum done pre pretty much everything for us, made sure we was at all the practices. If she couldn't make it, somebody got us there. So we was always just brought up in a way like, regardless of who that person is, i.e. our dad, that we're not him. We're never, ever going to be him. So you, we had to create our own paths within the football world or within life in general. And I think me and my brother handled that pretty well. I think a lot of the pressures that people were talking about was we kind of let people get on with that away from us. Everybody in our circle and our close immediate family, we never ever spoke about it. It was just something that we always heard and we were just like, yeah, whatever. And we just both got on with it and it worked out perfectly for both. I've obviously had my spell where I was very, very hot. When I was calling down, it seemed like my brother had his spell where he was very, very hot, although it was in the MLS. Mm. I'll tell you why um, I say this as well. Um, I'm more so a boxing fan, just being doing boxing myself. And right now there's this conversation about Chris Eubank Jr. fighting uh, uh, Conor Ben. And obviously the rivalry between the fathers back in the day. And straight away, and I get it from a media standpoint, from a promotional standpoint, they, they lean on the past in order to promote the future. At the end of the day, it's a business, yeah? So you've got to promote the fight. But it's almost unfair. You know, they're trying to draw parallels between two different individuals to their parents and expecting kind of the same thing all the time. And I just thought being a son of someone like Ian Wright, who's an absolute legend and everyone only speaks very, very highly of him, how you dealt with that, but you've, you've answered it. You kind of let them do their own thing and you become your own person. I've actually read quotes that you said, said, well, I don't even focus on that. I'm, I'm my own individual. Yeah, and that, that's basically how I bring my son up. It, forget about me, forget about your uncle, and forget about your granddad. Like, we're, we're your family members, but don't try to emulate what we've done in our careers. If anything, try to do better than us or just focus on yourself. Yeah. You, you know what you just said there, try and do better than us. Well, how was your father with you and your brother growing up? Like, talking about maybe you being in school or sports in general or football, soccer. Was, it, was he, like, you know, quite discipline with you or was he kind of like a bit of a free spirit and you would just find your own path? He trusted in our mum. Our mum raised us, so he he trusted everything. Obviously back then it was completely different. He he left mum for whatever reason. We was too young to really understand back then, but they get on like a house on fire still to this day. And he trusted in our mum to bring us up. If we needed getting in trouble, which was very rarely, my mum's brother, we was all scared of him anyway. So we never really stepped out of line. So we just, we pretty much just took a football everywhere with us. And we're, in a way, I would say, just like dad, we're self-taught. And just like my son, he's self-taught. I, I never push football on my son. We never got football pushed on us. It was something that I just feel with football, you have to fall in love with. And I think you can imagine it with boxing. Like you, you can't really be pushed into it because you're pushing somebody into taking punches in the face. That's just not a normal thing. And it's just a similar sort of thing in football. I just think if you keep pushing your kids into football, there's just pressure that they don't need from an, a certain age group, which can then lead to them thinking what happens if it doesn't happen rather than thinking, well, I enjoyed it while I played it. Now let's on to my next chapter. And I just always said to my son, you. As long as you enjoy it and you work hard, the rest will come. That's a very, very good advice. And part of the reason why I'm asking these questions, a bit of a selfish one, is I'm a father. You know, I've got Mason who's going to be four in November. I've got my youngest who's going to be one in September. And I'm already thinking, like, even the, the language I use with them, you know, you know, just trying to get into their mindset of thinking that in an abundant way, work hard, discipline, be morally right, etc. But at the same time, if I try and guy mason for example into boxing i would love him to be a boxer because i think it helps you with other aspects of your life it just gives you that self-confidence the reality is as you said if, if they're not, not falling in love with it or falling in love with the process i'm probably barking up the wrong tree yeah that's yeah. that's honestly what i'd say and and we've seen it and sometimes it's sad to say and i might be wrong in what i'm saying but the pressures could leave kids to do things we never want kids to ever do and we've seen it in the past for whatever reasons kids end up taking their own life. And that's just all because of there's too much pressure. They don't know what to do after all that eggs are in one basket. And I think if you take those eggs out of that and have one egg in one basket and so on, then it'll make the kid believe that I am a good footballer, but if it doesn't work, I can do this, 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 and this. 
And I just think what more parents need to just back off of their kids a little bit. Let them just enjoy what they're doing because they're young and there's plenty of time for everything they want to do. Definitely. Do you know the other thing I might about yourself and what, what, what you've achieved? Um, and this is just, again, not maybe my mindset, but just talking from like, the general public or if I had a conversation with someone down the pub, maybe about different footballers and your name will, will come up. I'll tell you what I'm trying to draw to. Going back to Chris Eubank and uh, Connor, Connor Ben, right? Nigel Ben was his obviously dad and Chris Eubank Sr. is Chris, Ju, Ju, Chris Eubank Jr.'s father, okay? They're both professionals. One has become world champion, I think, twice. And Connor Ben, in my opinion, is on the way to getting there. Both great fighters. But if you look at their style, Chris Eubank Jr. is quite similar to his dad. Like the flair, the arrogance and stuff. And then Conor Ben, I would say, he's not really a boxer. He's a fighter. He will yeah. get in now. And it doesn't matter whether he's fighting Mike Tyson, Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua or someone else. He will go in there and do what he always does, which is be absolutely aggressive. And you can kind of draw a parallel with his dad. He would have very much like that. And someone on the outside would go, yeah, well, obviously he's going to become a very successful boxer because genetically his dad was a good boxer. With yourself, this is not the case because some people may not know this, but you're actually adopted, yeah, correct, at the at the age of three. So that excuse for people's you know misconception about oh you're going to become a successful business person because your father was, you're going to become a successful footballer because your father was, or a boxer because your genetics. In actual fact, that wasn't the case for you. So you you just must have picked it up and fell in love with the sport, as you said, just because of your your surroundings and stuff. Yeah, but that that's that's what I was saying. It, it goes back to that. It doesn't yeah. matter who your parents are. Like, if you love something, you, you tend to learn and you, you become as good as you need to be at it. And and that that was the basis of what I said to my son when he when he was playing when he was Sunday League. I reckon it was around twelve to thirteen. Um, Man United wanted to sign him. City wanted to sign him earlier. And I was like, just enjoy the game because I said, there's one thing you can't teach in football is raw talent. And I imagine it's the same as boxing. You, there's certain things you just have as a boxer that maybe a trainer would not ever teach you. Like, and I think Prince Nazim was is a highlight of what I'm saying there because no boxing teacher would have taught Nazim to throw the punches the way he, he taught them, mm. the way he threw them. And mm. it made him successful. And I would say the same, Messi, what Messi has, you can't teach that. Yeah. You just, he just has it. Yeah. Whereas I think Ronaldo was a bit different. Ronaldo has that. Ronaldo shows you what hard work looks like and can achieve. Whereas I think Messi is just gifted, and he can do anything he wants to do at any given time. And Ronaldo worked as hard as he did to get to that point, and he's shown it in business, like you said, and on the pitch. Yeah, I was going to say actually is becoming the top athlete and achieving all the things that you've achieved and playing for some of the most incredible teams well in the world. Is it nature or is it really nurture? I think it's a bit of both. I think you you got to have both. I think some of it will be nature and the nurture part. You you have to train yourself. For real, used to tell me stories that when Ronaldo first came, when all the lads had days off, he was back in the training ground, in the gym, doing sit ups, watching YouTube videos, practicing his tricks, and he he seemed to be able to whatever he practiced, do it on the pitch as well. Some people and some kids can't do that. Yeah, do you know? Obviously, I saw it firsthand. I know you're not actively. Play, playing now you're, you're uh, 40 years of age but you look 25 still so I wish <laughs> I hope when I get to 40 I, I, I've got the same sort of uh, uh, look look myself um, you know look I don't know uh, your, your height five foot four. I say five foot six but I'm not I'm just under okay the reason why I mention this okay is that you know being a pro athlete and obviously Attack, you know, attacking and obviously scoring goals, you're going to come across some big people. I mean, I've had John Terry in here. I know Rio and myself, he lives in, in the same area as myself. And these are big, big people. I mean, they're very big. I mean, when I when Rio was talking about doing a defender to contender, becoming a pro boxer, I looked at him, I was like, you know, you, you're a big fella. If you hit anybody, they're going to feel it. And same with any of these big defenders. And when you were attacking these type of people, I mean... You've got to have some sort of mindset, skill set in order to get round these massive, massive individuals and and then pull off some spectacular goals. Yeah, but where there's a, an advantage to someone, there's always an, a disadvantage, and that's kind of the way I looked at it. I I knew all right, he's bigger than me, but 
he can't move his feet as quick as I can. So I know once I get past him, if he doesn't foul me, nine times out of 10, I'm away. And that that's just how I, I focused on. I grew up in South London, playing on a little, little grass area where we used to call it Nash Road. And the boys that we was playing with when I was 13 were like 18 and 19 year olds and they were much bigger than me and they was kicking me for three solid years. So I had to figure out a way and the same thing for my brother when he was smaller and we just had to get on with it. Yeah, well, I can resonate with that. The first time I went to a boxing club at the age of 14 years of age at Bromley and Downham, that's who I used to box for. I think the first or maybe a second time I went down there, they threw me into sparring, never sparred in my life before. And I was sparring these kids who were way older than me, had a few boxing uh, fights and they literally beat me up. And the guy said to me, a guy called Reggie Foster, who's still down there today with his son, he said, look, if you can take a few of these beatings, then I know you're ready to start doing boxing. And I think it's the same thing with, with football. If you get taken out a few times, a couple of elbows in your face, the weaker minded people probably wouldn't turn back up, but the stronger minded people wanted to make something of it would persevering and, and, and work out a way, as you said. Yeah, you kind of evolve and adapt. I think you have to. I think especially in the football world, especially over the last, what, you say 10 years, the way the, the game's evolved and changed is, is unbelievable. And that's across all the clubs in the Premier League. There was a time where, like you said, the back four would be six foot plus, plus the midfielders. Now everyone's more agile and, and can move around and there's a lot more of a passing game rather than direct long ball, elbows flying around. It's more tactical. Yeah. Is there a bit of an argument? It has become football. Certainly, I was going to say, Europe. I mean, UK, but maybe Europe. I don't know if there's more of a diving culture, maybe in certain other clubs in, in Europe. Do you think it's, do you think the game has become a bit soft? I wouldn't say soft, but I would say there's certain fouls that get given that when I look back at my career and look how I got hit, then it makes me think what's going on here. But I think at the same time, it, it, it's happened the way it's happening is because of they're trying to stop people from breaking legs and breaking, doing ligament damage, which could permanently ruin their career. So I think it, in both senses, it, they're just trying to take care of the players. But I do have to agree with you, but it's going to happen when you bring in those clever players, anything to get an advantage over the team, because sometimes we might think he's diving to win a foul when in effect he might be diving to get the guy a yellow card because if he gets him a yellow card then it'll be one nil to the attacker wouldn't it really because he can't tackle him anymore because mm. he's looking at a red yeah so yeah. as a manager now if he gets a yellow a manager's thinking do I take him off do I leave him on if I leave him on what happens if he gets a red we might lose this game which could have been played being a cup final do you know what I mean it could have lost the club out and the manager out on so many things so it's always a tactical side to it. And I I remember, um, I think <laughs> that I get a lot of stick from this, especially from my Newcastle fans but, and my friends. Um, Chelsea played Newcastle and I think it, it might have been Steve Howie. He got a yellow card at Stamford Bridge and he went to tackle me again. And he only touched me a little bit, but I went down. We get the free kick, we win the game, he gets sent off. So although it's bad to do, if you get touched and you go down and it's advantage to the team. It's almost like the rules are the rules. Um, but as an individual, you could, you could react or respond to that contact in a certain way in order to kind of influence the referee. Yeah. So you could either weather it and just like, that's nah, nothing. Or you could go just, you know, diving on the floor, rolling around it, et cetera. And I think that's what comes down to game gamesmanship. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's also people forget. So with attackers, there's so many times attackers get kicked and don't go down and don't get the free kick. So yeah. if they don't go down, they don't get a free kick or a penalty. But then if they do go down, they get called diving or they're cheaters. So I, I think at some point the referee has to start blowing the whistle whether players go down or not go down. And then I think that would slow this whole diving thing out. Yeah. Because um, I'm just recapping from back in the day when, uh, you know, players used to play like uh, more aggressively. They used to have the old ball. I know the ball has had to evolve from like the old pigs kind of intestines or whatever yeah. it is. And it doesn't matter, matter whether it was sleep rain whatever it was almost like they were kind of very very tough people now not saying they're not tough but it's almost like it has i feel like the culture is changing quite quite a lot and now they brought in this new vr system 
VAR. VAR, VAR, <laughs> VAR. Um, and what do you think about that, VAR? I'm not a fan of it. I, I like human error. I think it's good, um, especially more now as a fan. It, it sets up debates. Like it takes emotion out of, first of all, for the players. They don't know whether they can celebrate. If they do certain things, that everything's on like a knife edge for me. So I'm not a fan of it. I can understand why they use it. And there has been some decision and I've said, thank God for VAR. Like the women's game that I went to watch, the first goal or the second goal they scored may not have gone in or may not have been given if it wasn't for VAR. Now I was praying because I was watching an England ladies play and England get it. So it, it does have its benefits, but I still miss the fans that you used to see having debates in the pub. Was it a penalty? Was it not? It like all those little things are gone. Yeah, the, the culture of it. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what I miss about it. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, look, I want to take you back to, the, there's a thing I read online, uh, 2004, there was a friendly between England and Spain and you were one of the main targets for racist chants, okay? And what I loved about your response is this, I just let the football do all the talking. And I think that's testament to the fact that you're very, very professional. But at the same time, trying to put myself in your shoes, like you're getting onto a football pitch. Granted, it's a, it's a, it's a friendly game, but you're playing for England, which must make you feel amazing every time you do that. You're loved in the doors, you've got sponsors, you've got all these things happening, and then suddenly you get on a pitch and you're getting completely opposite what you think you're going to be welcomed into. I mean, how do you deal with, how did you deal with racist chants on the pitch? Well, I grew up in South London. So do I. Yeah. Told who I'm from. I'm from Broccoli, which is not too far from Bermondsey. So Bermondsey, and if I went to meet some friends in Eltham or around those areas, we used to get called names. So I grew up learning to have thick skin. Like I don't agree with what happened in there, but nor at the same time, am I going to let it get under my skin and ruin what I worked so hard to get? I think things like that, when that happens, players or managers shouldn't even have to come out and speak about it. I just think it should be dealt with straight away. Like it shouldn't get that far. The fact that I feel like now all players have to stand up and say something or post something on social media. I think that's wrong. I think there's enough governing bodies around football stadiums or around the world in football to take care of those situations. And that's just, that's just my stance on it. I'm not one that ever keeps talking about it because I feel like the more people talk about it, the more it stays alive and the more people pay more attention to it. It just needs to die out and they just need to start banding people that do stuff like that from football for good. Mm. I mean, how, how do you think it's a, because they, I mean, I think it's, I agree with you. I think if you give it too much concentration, it stays alive. And if you kind of ignore it, eventually it's got to go. But the catch 22 scenario is if you don't highlight it now, it's almost like, it's going to carry on and no one's really curbing the problem. But how do you think since 2004 to where we are now, 2022, what, what, what kind of things have they put in place I, I, to stop I think, it? I think, it's, I think it is getting better, but I still think it, it's, unless if the more these people are allowed to come back in stadiums, it's always going to happen. Yeah. Like you can't stop that once they tanked up their cell phone beers or whatever they may be drinking, they're, they're going to say what they're going to say. Mm. So the only way to do it is to keep it out. I think the biggest issue for me, not only is it affecting the players, but it's people got their kids in there. They're, they're making it seem like kids should hear these things. So they think it's okay to say as well, which is wrong. I don't want my kids hearing that. And imagine you don't want your kids hearing that. And we could say that about 70,000 plus people that go to games every week. And like I said it on GMTV, when all of it started happening in lockdown, I said, just ban them, like completely ban them. If you know who they are, send them to jail and, yeah. let, and see how they deal with it. Yeah. And um, on that note of this whole subject about, you know, racism and, you know, trolling, certain people you know it has gone into like the whole social media world and as a father i'm a bit fearful of my son now who goes on youtube like it's second nature to watch poor patrol yeah but over time that's going to turn into a social media account and then over time it's going to interact with yeah. their friends and i'm hoping he gets the best out of it and he gets you know education he gets a peer group that he looks up to or a social group and he gets motivation motivation because he's listened to good good podcast interviews or seen a good athlete he wants to emulate and etc but there is always a thing that i think you know he could get you know he could get trolled he could get abused on there um and as an athlete 
it's almost like common now that a lot of athletes, no matter your race or your gender or your background, you're gonna get you're gonna get slandered. That's the problem with social media. It opens up a doorway for people who don't know you or know anything about you. It gives them a doorway and a path to basically say and abuse you anywhere they want. I think the biggest problem is there is if we was to go on, say, Twitter or even Instagram and type in certain words, it doesn't let you type them. So I just feel like companies like Twitter and Instagram, even Facebook, whatever you want to call them, they, they have the power to nullify all this. They just choose it not to. They, they, they can't say it's anything to do with, oh, we don't have the money to do it because we clearly know you do. So I think if they wanted to put it to a stop, I personally think they can. Well, I mean, um, a good example of that was over the pandemic. You know, if you wanted to comment about the virus, Corona, whether you had a for or against view on it, they put a warning sign up. So if you're going to be hatred, slander, discriminate, etc., to to someone, you're going to, you know, attack them. They have the power to put some sort of barrier up or, or shadow ban you or whatever else. If I can ask, I mean, what 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 is kind of the worst thing that someone has said to you on social media? I don't get in social media beef. Like very rarely. Um, Not even a little DM they sent you? And no, I, I, I literally don't. I post and go. Like social media doesn't really rule my life. I try to engage with the, the nicer people that are on there. As for everything else, they can speak to themselves. And that's just how I look at it. I'm not, I won't give them my time. Like I'm, I'm all for engaging with people, having sensible conversation, listening to their opinions and let them hear what I feel then I'm good with, but anything abusive is good luck to them, mate. Yeah. They're just bored. Yeah. Yeah, and they've got a lack of self-esteem themselves. <laughs> yeah, they're just bored, so yeah. leave them to it. Um, I want to ask you about this. So my team, Chelsea, um, 2005, 18th of July, you signed to them for £21 million. I've got written down here. Yeah. Around right about, yeah. Um, probably your biggest record signing deal at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did that make you feel signing for Chelsea, twenty one million pound? I mean, and that I mean two thousand. That's that's a long time ago. So like, that's amazing. I didn't really think about it. Yeah. To, to be honest with you, I did. It's, I didn't set the price. If that makes sense, that's just between Man City and Chelsea how that price came around for for whatever reason. Um, yes, I was happy because that's how they rated me, and that's how Chelsea saw me, that's what they thought I was worth. So from that, I was happy. But in general, I didn't really care about the price. I just, like I say, everybody else will talk about it. And I think Jack Grealish last year was going through a similar thing. If Jack hadn't been, if been bought for 100 and was only bought for 50, people wouldn't be talking about, he's a 100 million player, he isn't doing this, he isn't doing that. And I, you could, in a way, say the same about Harry Maguire. If his price tag wasn't £80 million for a centre-back, he most probably or may not be getting the abuse he's been getting over the years. You'll get some of it based on his performances, but the price tag would never come up because everybody has bad games. Mm. Like, it's a given. You're not always going to be your best all the time. And apart from if you're Messi and Ronaldo, they, mm -hmm. they seem to somehow make it work. But yeah. um, in general, like, so there's always ups and downs. So I never really... And looked at it. And obviously, when I first came to Chelsea, I knew what challenges I was up against. I knew I was up against Damien Duff on good form, Robin, Joe Cole. I knew what it was. And I, I accepted the challenge once the deal was done. And it took, even took me a while to get going at Chelsea because the way Man City played to the way Chelsea played was completely different. Mm. Under a different manager, playing a con different, completely different way in a completely different system. And it was just one of those. You want you, you just have to put your head down, work, and just don't back down from any challenges. Yeah. Um, talking about this, this, this subject about the money transfers, etc., and wages. I'll, I'll put my cards on the table, right? As a thirty-six-year-old who, from a very, very middle-class background, I used to get absolutely inspired. Even though I never was ever going to pursue a football career, was you know, I played casually and I played for a few teams, but that, that as far as it went. But inspired me because I saw people at my age, at my at the time, earning a lot of money, good money, and I felt, well, you know what, I'm, that's not the profession I'm going to go down. But if they can earn it in one area, I should eventually be able to do the same because it principally comes down to the same. 
yeah. mindset. Yeah. It's work hard. It's do the basics right. It's work as a team in a business or on a football pitch and leverage certain things when you can in order to get to a, a, a better position. So it did motivate me, but there is a massive population out there as well. And I've even got friends or family members that criticize the, the game because of the amount of money is involved. The only one thing I can kind of understand where they're coming from is, going back to boxing, right? You take a kid from, we call it, you know, this is not always the case, but let's say a council estate, right? They're coming from wherever, wherever they come from, okay? Hard upbringing. My had a single parent, okay? They are a bit of a street fighter. Then they get into a boxing uh, setting. Then they sort of start be, being an amateur fighter. And then suddenly they get put into the pro ranks. They start knocking all these people out and become world, world champion. And you would say it's almost because of the grit and determination from a very poor, humble background and a tough background. They, they became this, this warrior, you know, this very, very strong individual. But then you do see them if they become world champion, not all, but some of them can go slightly the other way because I think Sugar Ray said it, it's hard to get up at four o'clock in the morning to go for a run when you're in silk pajamas. Yeah. It's almost like suggesting that once you've got the money, once you've got the fame, once you've got the accolades, the hunger slows down. It goes. So going a very long winded kind of question I'm asking you here, but like going back to it, like if you're getting paid 200, 300 grand a week, do you think sometimes your hunger could go? Depends whether you love the game or not. So if you're doing it for the love of the game, you you don't need hunger. You just enjoy playing football. I always enjoyed what I did. Don't get me wrong. When it was pre-season, I moaned because I hated just running without football. But as soon as the ball was out, mm. I, I would just train all day. If I had to be there three times a day, I would be there three times a day, just kicking a ball around, having a laugh. So I just think it's more of that. Like I think you have to look at it that whether we like it or not, in all parts of the world, whether it's business, what no matter what, what whatever sport it is, if a player is good at something, they're not necessarily doing it because they love the game. Some of them might just be doing it because of the lifestyle. It's something we're never going to be able to answer. But I do think that if a player deserves it, they should get it. Whether it's a timing situation, whether the age might, I think maybe the way they could deal with it is maybe say after a certain age, then it can change, but it's, it's never gonna cap. It's almost like saying you work here with, with your boss. If your boss decided, oh, I wanna put you on 200 grand a month, are you gonna say no? Of course. <laughs> yeah. like, did you get what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So as much as people blame like the players and the kids, they're not gonna turn, not gonna say no to it if they're getting it offered. Of course. They're not in there negotiating their own deals. That's other people. Yeah. It's nothing to do with the player. The player doesn't say, oh, I want this much money. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. The club will say, this is what we're thinking about. His agent will say, how about this? And that's it. So majority of the times, although the players get the stick, they, they have nothing to do with a lot of that negotiation. At the end of the day, boxers, footballers, any top athlete, we're all human, right? Yeah. We've all got our families to look after and we've all got goals, aspirations and things we want to achieve and experience. You know, we all probably like the same things, which is travel, you know, not finer things in life nice house, nice car, etc. So of course, I mean, I don't care, whoever's listening to this podcast, I don't care whether you're into football or not, if someone offered you for the current work that you're doing right now, <laughs> the same 200 one. grand exactly. a month, are you telling me that you're criticizing football but you wouldn't take, take it, it yourself? Exactly, that, that's my point. And that's what people just have to understand. I, I, I just think, I can understand why they say it, but at the same time, they, they need to take the heat off the players because it's not all on them. They're, they're performing and enjoying something and playing the best that they can. And if that's what gets offered to them, they're going to jump here like any other human being. Yeah. Can I ask, it's a bit of a direct intrusive question, but again, I do get inspired by it. At the heart of your career, how much was you earning? Nothing near close to that. What about a week? 100 grand? Nothing near close to that. 50? Round about. Yeah, yeah. Right, everybody thinks differently, but I didn't. You, you asked a lot of people. I didn't care. Dad, or dad, and especially mum, always just said to me, "Look, never chase it. If it's gonna come, it yeah. will come. That will come from you playing well, or you doing, or working hard. But in general, never chase it." Well, that's really, really good advice. I, I've said this a few times on my podcast. David Hay once said when he was converting from cruiserweight undisputed champion to heavyweight, the guy actually asked him, "How much do you want to earn as a heavyweight?" 
pro boxer, someone that potentially could become heavyweight champion of the world. He said, don't think of that. And he said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, I focus on becoming heavyweight champion and it may be undisputed and I know the money will just come. And true to his word, that's what happens. Yeah, that's that's how it goes. Yeah. But as soon as you start thinking about all the numbers and stuff, so you're, you're kind of your eyes off the prize because you're not looking at what you're actually trying to achieve. You're looking at what you're going to get from achieving it. Yeah. Well, it's about providing value first and the rewards will come. come you after. focus on the rewards and you forget about the value, then things start turning south. One of the reasons why I've asked you this question is because I've had likes of Anton Ferdinand on here, Kieran Richardson, Simon Cox recently. There was a few few different footballers I've had on here. Uh, Liam Ridgewell, uh, Gary O'Neill. And there is a common thing. I had this good conversation with Anton actually about when you start making money as an athlete, but I would say more so maybe, maybe in football, it might be changed now, but you can become a bit of a target for maybe the wrong brands, wrong financial advisors and that kind of stuff. But with you, because you had a dad who's lived and breathed it and been there and done it before, was you kind of guided right with the whole kind of money setup stuff? You can only get guided so much, I think. I think there's, there's, everyone's still going to get burnt. I feel like that, that it's going to happen because you're going to see a project that you might think is good, even though you're advised not to yeah. or guided away from it, you will still have a dabble on the basis that, especially if you're young, that I feel like you would have a dabble thinking that, okay, if it does, if it, if it goes tits up, basically, you, you got time to try and make it back. Mm. Whereas now, I don't, I think the players coming through now are much more protected than say me, my generation, which had obviously Anton and Gary O'Neill and Ridge, where I think where the new generation coming through is more protected than that. And we was a little bit more protected than say my dad's era. Okay. So it, it's getting better in respect of that. And a lot of people are getting sniffed out. Yeah. So, uh, City, Chelsea, Queens Park Rangers, went, and then obviously went over to America, New York, etc. Um, highs and lows of all, all these clubs. Like you know, when you when you reflect, do you say, okay, that particular club is where I had my best time, or this particular club I found it a little bit sort of edgy? Is there do anything? You know, do you know what? Um, I'm not one that regrets anything, uh, but I'd say mentally challenging. I think the hardest place I was was. Um, at QPR, QPR, my s- second or third year in, um, trying to play on an injury and then basically people trying to make out I was only there for the money and blah de blah all that. That was like the most challenging time for me um, to try and stay headstrong because f- go through all my career, no- never really had bad things come out about me, especially to do with football. And to have that was kind of like, wow. You actually think that, and I just, and I felt like coming out and saying something, but I said, you know what, just leave them to it and just get on with it. And then I think when I went to sign for um, New York Red Bulls, um, someone came over. I think it was a Daily Mail did an interview with me over there, and they was talking about um, why did you sign? I think he said, why did you sign for Red Bulls if you wasn't making it as much as you was at QPR? I said, and I turned around and said to him, because I wasn't at QPR because of the money. I said, if I was at QPR for the money, I might as well have gone to China or somewhere like that and played football. I said, I I just signed for Red Bulls at the start because I was there for my brother's wedding, basically. And the manager, I trained there to keep fit because I was at a contract at QPR. And the manager said to me, would I, would I sign? I said, yeah, of course I would. So it'd be cool to play with my brother and it would be cool to help some of the younger kids coming through in America. And the first thing he said is, we don't have a budget now because you're halfway through the season. I said, I'm not here for that. I'm here to play football one more time with my brother before I retire. And that's what I did. Yeah, amazing. I actually read as well, I think it was 2015 when you signed and you got re-signed in 2016 in Jan, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, Bradley Wright Phillips, obviously you've been your brother. Uh, there was a moment, I think that you, you assisted on one of his goals my as well. My first game, yeah. Amazing, man. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that must have like, obviously did the money, playing for certain clubs, achieving everything you've achieved. But then that moment, that that, sp- that, that moment with your brother, that must have felt like, you, you must have felt you, like you're on top of the world. But it's one of those you can't, money can't buy that. It doesn't matter how much you got, you cannot buy those little moments. And I think there's a lot of brothers that play in the game and will say the same, that it, it takes two players to work hard to put yourself in that position. And 
that doesn't you don't pay for that that's yeah. just something you either have or or you don't have yeah it's a bit like uh gary neville philip neville when they were playing at, uh, man united i mean it's probably the only the only scenario i can think of where two brothers were actively playing with each other yeah and it's it's for a lot of people it would be a dream come true and i think there's a few coming through now if you if you look at um, the bellinghams okay if he comes to england and obviously he's brother gets signed there's a possibility he could be playing alongside his brother in the Premier League yeah which would be awesome to see uh, I know you said uh, right uh, Man City Chelsea there was a different different style of play I'm, I'm quite interested to see what you're going to obviously I know you're going to be professional you're a very professional man but Jose Jose Mourinho right um, I loved him from a, from a fan's point of view and I loved the way he was like coming and saying um not I'm the, I'm the chosen one. I mean, that's kind of like what a boxer would say. And I would expect <laughs> Conor McGregor to say that. But to have a, have, a, have, a, have a manager that comes to a club that says that, I mean, like, you've got to have some balls. Like, really have got to have some balls. And he pulled it off. But what was he like working underneath? I think, Mr. He, was, I think he was unbelievable. I, I loved him. I had so much respect for him, just the way he did things. Um, and this is a story I always tell because that is when I realised he always had a plan or he was always premeditated. So first of all, when we trained, we was always training. So say we had, just say like Liverpool Saturday, then on the Wednesday, there was a Champions League game or even FA Cup game against anyone it could be. Wow. As you could just say Man United for conversations. Um by the time we got to Thursday, we had already been training in preparation for the Man United game right? without realising. So we was always one week in advance in preparations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, we had Spurs, was it, the, I think, was it the FA Cup? I think it might have been the FA Cup. And he came up to me on Thursday and he said, I'm not going to start you this game, but if we're losing, I'll bring you on at half time. We'll get a draw then we'll go back to White Hart Lane and we'll win. So of course, I just laughed it off thinking, okay, this is just his way, just so I don't get upset that I'm not playing in the game. And I was like, all right, let me just put my head down and get on with it. Game came, Stamford Bridge. We was three nil down, I think after 30 minutes. By the end of the game, it was three, three. We went to Stamford Bridge and won. And after that, I was like, Fucking hell, this guy really like Im imagines a situation before he picks his team. And that's kind of when I realized, um, I think the problem he's had with everywhere else is the squad he had at Chelsea, although there was egos in there, we all had mutual respect for each other and what the manager was doing. And because he was getting results on the top of it, everything he was doing in the press was perfect for us because he was keeping the heat off of us. He was taking all the heat away from us with everything he said, like the chosen one. People are not talking about the team no more, whether we played bad or not. Everyone's talking about what Mourinho says. Mm. And he's very clever at doing stuff like that. The Because um, what some people won't, won't appreciate, if you're a bit of a casual sort of football fan, and I actually think I'm a more of a casual football fan. I was more into it back in the day, but then sort of boxing took over for me. So I don't follow it as much. Um, but... You know, someone like Jose Mourinho wasn't actually a footballer. He was interpreter, wasn't he, for, for Bobby? Uh, yeah, he was interpreter. And then he did the um, videos. So we will do all the match, bring yeah. all, put all that together as well. So like, not like, I always say the same thing about boxing trainers. You kind of need to have a former pro boxer, or so, certainly someone that was very active as a boxer, to understand the psychology of the boxer so you can train them and mentor them and look after them in the corner. Because when you're against the ropes and you're getting beaten up, you need to come back to the corner and have someone there that goes, right, this is what you do in this scenario. And then come out with a game plan. Credit to this man, like wasn't on the pitch, you know, was on, on, on the outskirts of doing stuff, but literally systemized team after team after team with different clubs in different parts of the world, different leagues. And won so many fucking trophies. I mean, he's really, really adored. But it does seem like since that kind of second wave at Chelsea, things are just not going his way. Why do you think that is? I think too much player power. I think especially if you look at his spell at Man United, that same team that pretty much got him the sack got Ole Gunnar Solskjaer his job. 
what and that same team was the same group of players when Solskjaer got sacked said they don't know what they're doing now if they don't know what they're doing under Solskjaer how do you manage to get him a deal but you was under a manager that knew what he was doing and was giving you the tactics but you managed to get him sacked mm. do you get what I mean mm. so there, there has to be something in it and if you if you look at a lot and, and then Solskjaer goes and the same problem again so you think there's a lot of politics in football yeah there's, at the moment. there's there's one thing I don't miss about the game there's a there's a lot of politics in football in general and that's just something that comes with it what's the worst bit of like politics or things that you don't miss that you could kind of highlight I'll just I would say in in some teams that you you can even see it now like just watching it there'll be players that you will see that will play even if they ain't playing well they will just keep playing and someone will come and play well and it doesn't mean anything. And there's always like a reason behind it. It might be because they've signed him for however much money or he might just be the manager or the coach's favorite. You never know. There might be multiple reasons or he's getting told from upstairs he has to play. That just comes with the game. Do you know, just touching on Marina, because I, 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 I I'm very intrigued by this man. I would love to meet him one day. In actual fact, one of my goals is I would love to interview him one day. So if you're listening, mate, <laughs> jump, jump on. Um, <laughs> The arrogance that he had in the media, like the perception, yeah, which I loved. I love the arrogance. I think that that professional arrogance kind of drew people towards him and they bought into his confidence. But was he really like that behind the scenes? Like what you saw on TV was what it was like when no. he was in the changing room. He, he's such a, a warm, loving person. I, when I went to QPR and I think the first game that Chelsea played, QPR for Stamford Bridge, um, and I hadn't seen him or spoke to him for a bit. First thing he did was come up to me and ask me how my son is. When I used to bring my kids to training, one of them would stay with the secretary and the other one would be outside. And while we was training at Chelsea, he would be playing football with my son with like, and doing the tactics on the ball at the same time. And he's just always remembered him. So that's, that's the type of person he is away from the game. I just think the persona, he, it obviously he has to have some of that persona in there to just change to that in front of the media. Mm. But at the same time, it, I, like I said earlier, I think a lot of it is to keep the eyes off his team rather than on his team for the little mistakes I'm making or not winning it. He'll just say some stuff. And all of a sudden Mourinho said this, Mourinho said that. Now you're not clever. talking, yeah, now you're not talking about his team. Yeah, very clever. That, that Chelsea side then, you know, there was the likes of Lampard, um, uh, John Terry, you mentioned Damien Duff. I forgot all about that guy. He was an incredible <laughs> Irish uh, footballer. Yeah. The one that you said, actually, which I will always, I, I felt sad when he left, was uh, Robin. 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 Yeah. Uh, went to Bayern Munich, didn't yeah. he? And then we obviously beat them in the Champions League final. And then they obviously had Didier Drogba. I mean, like, what was it like playing with some of these people? You just have to be on your A game every day. Like, who it was, was the one? Is men? It was... It was always mentally challenging because you know, you're at the top club and you know, regardless of whether you win a title or not, next year, there's most probably gonna be another four top players coming through the door. So you always had to be mentally ready for any challenges that came. Mm. And it was just one of the things, but the thing we had when we was all there, we, we was all a family. Nobody hated on any other player for playing more than that player. Um, certain system that changed. Uh, I think if you speak to Joe Cole, there was a system change. I think Lampsy was injured. I was playing like attacking midfielder. Joe was on the right and we would just chop and change. So you just learn to build relationships with each other and it just, it just works out. Yeah. Out of like, all the two clubs that you played with, you've probably been asked this a million times, uh, Sean, but for the benefit of the conversation, like who is the one that you played the next to in your team or even against maybe you thought that person has been sent down by God? They are literally here to absolutely fuck shit up in, in, in Earth, on Earth. Do you know what? I'd say um, Coley, Ashley Cole, man. Really? Playing against him and then with him and then obviously for England and then seeing what he was still doing for England when I wasn't playing for England. No matter how much stick he got away from the game, he just seemed to get better and better and better. And, I, I don't know, and he always just amazed me, all the running. Some of the runs he did, he knew he wasn't getting the ball. He just did it just to make the attackers tired. He would just run there, run across the defence. And I'm like, Coley, where are you going, bro? But you know, he's one of those guys for me. Um, 
Right, so you're 40 years of age, right? You're obviously a father, you've achieved a lot. You're clearly, you know, doing stuff still in football, punditry and et cetera, or, you know, uh, sort of got your hand in it still. I had a conversation last week with Simon Cox, who used to be a premiership footballer and played for multiple different clubs in championship and first division, etc. And he played for Republic of Ireland. Um, and I think he had a stint in, a, in Australia. And then last year he retired, okay? He admitted to me that the moment he retired, he was a bit of a lost soul. I think in life, you're either a meaningful specific, so you're specifically going towards a goal, whether that's business, financial, whatever, or, or, or fitness, or you become a sometimes a general, sorry, wondering gen, gen, generality, which is you don't really have a plan, you're just sort of bumping, bumping around. And I can see a lot of athletes can fall into the latter. They just kind of retire and don't know what to do. So like, did you have a plan after football and what are you actually doing behind the scenes? It's a hard one, actually. <laughs> I mean, it, it was weird because obviously I was at Phoenix Rising at the time. I had another operation on my knee. I was doing rehab. And in that time of my rehab, the allocations at Phoenix got filled in because they can't wait too long because if they wait long enough and I don't come back how they want me to come back, then the play they might have wanted to get is gone and it may mess up what the club wanted to achieve. So I was just doing my rehab, not thinking about it. And then I was thinking, well, do I really want to move state again? Because it's quite a lot of hassle, especially on your own. you got to think about how you're getting your car to the next Did state. not have your family with no, you? No, I was always on my own. Wow. Um, so they're back in the UK? Yeah. So that must be hard as well. So I was, Yeah, so it was tough. So I was like, do you know what? And then before it got to the end of the week, before I even decided what I was going to do, Man City contacted me and said, do you want to do some ambassadorial work for us while you're in the States? And I just said, yeah. And then it kind of just went on from there. And I just... A year later, I was on Soccer AM and I said, clearly I've retired now, but I think I retired a year before that and I was just working. So I kind of just fell into things and then I started producing music with my cousin, which I, which I really enjoy. Now I got into um, doing sh luxury leather goods. So I have a shop in Mayfair now as well, which yeah. I'm just trying to push now, what, what's which is shop tough. Uh, Maison DF. Okay. So I'm just trying to get that running and that moving now. And that's where my focus is. And then I'll go back to the music. Nice. And what sort of music is it? Um, tends to be house more for me. Okay. How, normal like funky house stuff. And then you got your, I wouldn't say pop house, but charty house where it's more vocalized. So I'm getting a bit of a sensation. You're an IB for man. Do you know what I've been? But I don't go that often. <laughs> but I would. <laughs> so so where does Sean Mike Phillips go on his holidays? No, I haven't been anywhere. I just work at the minute. Like right. all this trip I've been working. Right. Uh, right. I'm planning on going somewhere in first international break. Right, right. Okay, cool. So the music, you've got obviously your, your luxury uh, brand and then like things like property and stuff and anything else like that? No, just those three at the minute. They're keeping me more than busy enough with all the admin I've got to do, so. Yeah. So look, you're a young 40 year old bro. Uh, where do you see yourself in the next five or 10 years? What what other things you, you, you're gonna be planning towards or doing? You just watch the space. Yeah, yeah. you got things bubbling in the background, yeah? yeah. <laughs> all right, good stuff. Well look, I know you need to leave pretty shortly and I really, really appreciate your time, bro. Um, I do have one more question, okay? When I first come up with my podcast, when I, when I started my first business, actually, when I was 24 years of age, I came up with a mantra. Part of the reason why is because of the company I have was a sales company. So I would say about 80, 90% of the people in that sales company were men, alpha type men, probably no different to a football football yeah. football squad. And I had to come up with a, a bit of a, a life mantra uh, incantation to keep them on their game. And it goes like this, be happy, never content. Now, if I was to ask Sean Wright Phillips, what does be happy, never content mean to you? What's your interpretation of that? If you're saying be happy, I'd say it, it kind of stems back to the conversation, what we were saying within boxing and sports, like be happy doing what you're doing, strive towards your goal. If, you, if I'd say like never content, I'd see content as in a way as just settling for what? it is what you got already rather than trying to make it better or bigger. That's a good answer, bro.
All right, thank you for your time, mate. <laughs> no problem. Likewise. You. And uh, absolute on our plan, a very, very small part. <laughs> we're playing, oh. we're going to play again next year, aren't we? Yeah, definitely, man, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, so you sign up to next year? Yeah, yeah, I've already told the boys. Yeah, lovely. Good stuff, right? All right, thank you very much for listening to this. Subscribe, share it, and be happy, never content. Thank you very much. Thank you.